than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and Very important step to, provide, to guarantee the asset property we talked about earlier. So again, it's the same uh, administrative stuff, right? Project three is due on Sunday, right? November uh, the 14th. Uh, hopefully everyone has uh, started on that, right? Uh, and homework four is due actually pretty soon, right? Just uh, this Wednesday. Um, so hopefully everyone are on track for them. So uh, today, right after the lecture, again, there will be uh, this talk from a database company called Vertica, which is actually a uh, spin-off from my advisor's advisor, right, Max Dombreaker from MIT. Uh, and they are going to talk about uh, the new things uh, that they are doing with their uh, column store uh, database, all right? <laughs> so today, we're going to talk about logging. So as I mentioned earlier, right, the important properties the database system want to ensure for the programmers right, to deal with the, uh, all the kind of headache issues with the data, dirty write, power failure, is that it's a, there's this set of property called ACID the system want to ensure, right? So uh, we talk about uh, lots of things about concurrency control algorithms and protocols in the last two weeks, and those concurrency control mechanisms were mostly trying to achieve the isolation property, right? So today, we are going to talk about logging and recovery that are very important to help the database system to achieve the rest of the properties in ACID, namely uh, automaticity, uh, durability, as well as uh, consistency. But for consistency, we will talk more about them uh, in the distributed database system setting, right? For today, it's more uh, focusing on uh, automaticity and consistency. So to give you a little bit of motivating example about the importance of uh, logging and recovery, right? Here, I give you, <laughs> oh, by the way, so this logging and recovery actually, uh, it, it's, it's a specific component, but it's going to actually uh, touch many of the other components of the database system, right? So it will actually work with many of the things, uh, components we discussed earlier in the, in the class, especially the buffer pool manager, to achieve this uh, automaticity and uh, durability property. So again, giving you the uh, motivating example about the importance of uh, logging and recovery. Here, say I have this uh, transaction, uh, just a read on away, write on away, perform a record, right? Here, I'm also showing you what would be the content in my buffer pool and what would be the content on disk, right? So here, Let's say we start this transaction right read on A and assume that there's no content in the buffer pool at the beginning uh, of everything, right? So what it first need to do is that the database system first need to read, uh, brought, brought this page um, into the buffer pool, right? And then perform the read. And then it needs to write on A, so assume that it just changed the value of the A from one to two, right? So uh, now, uh, assume that the, the, the database system uh, wants to commit, and then, let's say, uh, without any uh, protection mechanism or login recovery mechanism, what do we do? I mean, based on what we talked about earlier in the class, that we'll just, when the system commit, we'll just get back to the client or the outside world, right? Say, hey, we already commit. But what if before, I mean, after we tell the outside world that every system already commit, but before we flush this page out to the disk, there's a power failure, right? Say, I mean, I mean, somehow there's a storm or somebody just kicked a power plug and then there's a failure. Uh, the database system lost all the things in memory, lost all the processes, et cetera, right? So now, in this case, when the, if you restart the database system uh, back up again, then what you'll see on the disk is that it's just still this value one on disk, right? You haven't been able to see the latest uh, commit from uh, this transaction if you haven't been able to write this, disk, uh, write this page on disk yet. So this would actually be incorrect, right? Because you already get back to the outside world, right? Say this transaction is trying to uh, save $100 for you and then already committed, you, you got notified the transaction has committed, but then the $100 actually is not going to be added on your bank account on disk, then this is bad, right? So that's exactly what uh, logging and recovery are going to deal with. <laughs> So uh, just uh, formally speaking, logging and recovery, re recovery uh, mechanism would be uh, uh, techniques to ensure the consistency, automaticity, uh, as well as uh, the durability of the database system, especially uh, during the failures. And at high level, there are two parts about this logging and recovery mechanism. And actually, just pretty much uh, by, the, by the naming, you kind of naturally tell, you can naturally tell that there are two parts, right? The first part will be called the logging part, 
That's when the database system is running normally, right? With, when it is executing all the transactions, it needs to do a certain task, right? Record a certain metadata or different changes made by these transactions. I mean, at the runtime, when it is normally running uh, in a certain uh, place, right? Sometimes in memory and sometimes on disk. So that later on, for the second part is that after a uh, crash, right, when the database uh, come back again, there's a second part called a recovery uh, a protocol or like an um, algorithm that's going to look at the earlier information, the metadata, all the changes recorded by the first login part, and then restore the state of the database system back into a correct state, right? So there's a login part and there's a recovery part. So today <laughs> we are going to focus on the first part, which would be the uh, additional operations that the database system needs to do when it is like normally running executing transactions to ensure that there's enough information and metadata, et cetera, uh, that the database system can use when it comes back from a power failure to restore the system in the correct state, right? That would be uh, on what we talk about on Wednesday for the second part. So uh, there are actually uh, many topics uh, to uh, discuss about even for just for the first top. The, for, the first would be that what kind of failures that the, the logging can, and recovery can deal with, right? So the database system actually cannot deal with any type of failure. For example, if there's a fire going on, you just burn all the disk in the data center, then everything will be lost, right? There's nothing can bring you back from that scenario unless you have some redundancy, right? That would be a separate topic. And the second of all, like I mentioned, uh, logging and recovery would also touch many parts of the system we talked about earlier, especially the buffer pool manager part. And we actually need to do some um, modification or enhancement of the buffer pool management policy to uh, collaborate with the logging and recovery part to achieve automaticity and durability. And we also talk about uh, two specific methods for logging, shadow pitting and uh, write ahead log. And we'd also talk about uh, what the content or the logging scheme, right? That's essentially what content we are writing to the log. Lastly, we'll give a little bit heads up on how we do checkpoints and we'll get more about checkpoints on Wednesday when we talk about recovery. All right. <laughs> so uh, the one important concept, right? So we to talk about before I get into the type of failure is what would be the different type of storage device that the database system could use, right? So essentially, based on the property of the storage device and how the database system used them, we are going to categorize the different kind of failures that the database system may encounter and what kind of failure we can, that the system can address or what type of failure the system cannot address, all right? So <laughs> the uh, very uh, basic three types of storage uh, we will we'll, uh, talk about or classify uh, that the database system would use would be called uh, volatile storage, normal house storage, and also st stable storage. So these concepts are kind of straightforward, right? Volatile storage, which just means that uh, the type of storage that you, it would lose all the data if there's uh, things like a power failure right? or a program exit, that's such as DRAM or uh, SRAM. And then non volatile storage would just be things like HDD or SD, as, sorry, SDD would persist all its data when a power failure happens. And the third type of storage device is sort of a um, hypothetical or conceptual device, right? which, which just means that a type of storage device that would persist its data in when, there, when encountering all kinds of failures, right? Burning uh, data center, et cetera. But this type of device is mostly just uh, for conceptual or discussion purpose. Right? It doesn't really exist, right? So in practice, mostly we're just dealing with either volatile storage or non-volatile storage, all right? So following that, there will be uh, three types of uh, failures that the database system may encounter that we classify them into. The first will be transaction failure, second will be system failure, and uh, third will be storage media failure. Let me uh, explain that, all right? So third, the first would be called a transaction failure, right? So that would be uh, the type of failures associated with the execution of transactions. And again, <laughs> oh, actually, a uh, little bit uh, uh, heads up before I go into the detail, right, about the two, three type of failures. The type of failures that logging and recovery can deal with will actually be the first two, right? The third type of failure, storage media failure, that's not something that the database system would deal with uh, by itself, right? It would be need some external um, help or like uh, some redundancy uh, created by human to deal with. I just give you a heads up, okay? So uh, for the first type of transaction failure, right? Failures related to execution of transaction. So again, we're going to classify uh, this uh, type of failures in two uh, categories. The first type would be called um, logical errors. That would be uh, essentially means that 
there, when you are executing this transaction, right, certain transaction may violate the uh, internal constraints, right, or consistency um, specifications uh, required by the user, right? Again, uh, an earlier example I used in the class is that assuming that uh, you, are, you have a database that's handling all the bank accounts uh, for a specific bank, and you are just only moving money within different accounts, uh, moving money for different accounts within this bank, right? Then in that case, no matter how you move money around, assuming no interest have been applied yet, at the end of the day, all the money should sum up to the, to the same number, right? And if uh, that uh, somehow one transaction come along, move money around, but then the total amount of money has changed, then that will violate uh, a constraint, right? So that will be a logical failure. And then some transaction or this transaction needs to be aborted, and the database system can handle that, right? And restore all the changes. The second type of failure would essentially uh, call the internal state errors, and then mostly the, 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 the most straightforward example would be all kinds of um, uh, deadlocks, right? The aborts we talk about when we uh, discuss the concurrency control protoc protocols, right? For example, uh, if the Zap system is trying to schedule a set of transactions and then there's a deadlock, then the system needs to abort certain transaction and then make sure the database system is in a correct state, right? And then that abort will just be called a internal state error. And the system will also handle that with logging and recovery, all right? The second type of failure would be called a system failure. And then also at high level, categorize them into uh, two different categories. The first would be called a software failure, which would mean that uh, either there's a, typically there, there could be a bug either in the OS or in the database system cause the system to crash or, or the OS can panic, right? For example, if there's a uh, division by zero exception somewhere in the logic of the database system that is just uh, uncaught, then when uh, a transaction hit that, the whole program would exit and crash, right? And then everything uh, within the pro processes and then the temporary memory space of that process uh, would just be lost, right? Can have to deal with that. Second type of failure, and probably actually be, be the very common, uh, I don't know whether the most common, but a very common type of failure would just be power failure, right? There's, say there's a storm, there's a heavy rain, someone just kicked the power plug, and then you lost everything in memory, right? <laughs> and then uh, the database system would also deal with that. So one assumption we are making here is that with the second type of uh, hardware failure, we are assuming that those are not the type of failure would have caused uh, the loss or, or corruption of the data on the disk, right? So even though you have a power failure, we are assuming that the data is uncorrupted. If the data is corrupted and somehow a value on the disk is changed by some uh, forces, we, uh, alongside the hardware failure, then the database system itself mm, is difficult to fix that. Uh, that said, there could be mechanism that the database system uh, apply to detect those kind of uh, failures, right? But it just, uh, it cannot deal with it by itself unless you have some human to apply some redundancy external to the system, all right? So the first type, uh, the transaction layer failure as well as the second type, system failures, those are the failures and that, that the database system can deal with with logging and recovery. And lastly, would just be the uh, uh, storage media failure, right? So your, essentially, your data could be uh, corrupted on the disk with uh, some fire, uh, right? That just uh, destroy, burn all the disk in your data center. Then you would need something. So uh, you, you can, you can. I mean, there are ways to deal with that, right? But uh, uh, it's not through a login and recovery, right? You could use, for example, redundant disk, and you can apply. You can install a read array, right, of all your disks. Or uh, in the next class, or next, in next week, uh, we also talk about distributed database, right? You can install additional copies, but it's not a job of the login and recovery. Um, so uh, for the, our purpose today, we are not going to uh, talk about. Oh, I mean, the, 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 the message is not going to address this type of failure. All right, so any questions on different types of failures and what's the responsibility of uh, our database algorithms, especially logging and recovery? All right, makes sense? All right, cool. <laughs> so why we need to talk about that? Okay, so a, 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 a fundamental observation about database system is that, well, database system mostly deal with data stored on disk, right? Uh, so it will make it want to make sure that all the data the users uh, put into the database system would be uh, durable and persistent uh, on a non-volatile storage device. But through our discussion earlier in this course, we observed that hey, if we just always uh, write and read data on disk, it's going to be very slow, right? So uh, ideally, we don't want to perform every single operation um, from and onto the disk. We want to have some. Uh, 
staging error, which is essentially buffer pool in memory that we can um, just uh, modify or read and modify pages in this uh, temporary uh, uh, in memory space, which would be uh, much, much faster, right? And of course, uh, this would be ha this would have issue where you haven't written uh, the dirty pages onto disk, then they would cause essentially the corruption issue. Or when, when there's a power failure, you don't have uh, the records of committed transaction on disk, right? So that's why we because we have this uh, buffer pool area uh, with these temporary records in memory. That's why we need this additional mechanism to protect the database uh, from uh, from uh, I mean the potential corruption from power failure, right? And just to recap. <laughs> how the uh, buffer pool uh, works. Essentially, every time uh, you want to, for example, modify a, data, a, a beta record um, in the uh, content of the database, what you would need to do is that you would first actually uh, retrieve a copy of this page from the disk, I mean, your non-volatile storage device, to memory, right? And then you uh, perform all your modification there, and after you finish all the modification, you want to flush this dirty page back into the uh, persistent uh, storage, or in other words, non-volatile storage, right? So that's the uh, high-level procedure. And with logging and recovery, we're actually going to, um, again, modify or extend this, uh, these steps a little bit, right, in collaboration with our algorithms uh, to achieve the durability and uh, automaticity, even though uh, when do we don't want to uh, perform all our operations on disk all the time, right, which will be slow, right? So again, to recap a little bit about uh, the purpose of logging and recovery, and especially under the concept of ACID, all we are trying to do today, right, especially automaticity and durability, would be that we want to make sure that the changes of all committed transactions would be persistent on a non-volatile storage device before we tell the outside world or the clients that the transaction has committed, right? That's called um, Auto, uh, durability, right? Make sure that everything is persistent before we say it is a commit. <laughs> and another property, which would be automaticity, would means that we don't want the change of any uncommitted transaction right, to be uh, persistent on disk. Right? And we can, we can temporarily apply the changes of uncommitted transaction, but we don't want uh, the uh, effects of uncommitted transaction to be durable, right, if, if, it's, um, if the transaction is aborted. Make sense? All right. So the uh, fundamental two primitives or two type of uh, records that we are going to uh, let the database system to, uh, I mean, record to help us achieve those uh, functionality, right, or guarantee uh, those properties will be called, the first type would be called undo records or sometimes called undo log records, right, similar thing. The second type will be called redo records, right. So the undo records, would actually uh, store the effects of any uh, uncommitted transaction, right? So that when this transaction aborts, then I mean the database system can restore any potential changes by those aborted transactions. All right. So the second type of records that the database system is going to record again help us to achieve this acid property is called a redo record, right? Which would essentially be the records again to uh, store the effects of um, any I mean, changes that a transaction apply so that when there's a power failure happen, right, we can look back and see what will be the effect of modifications made by the committed transaction. And then these read records will help the data system to restore all the modifications by the committed transaction. Right. And we are going to use um, these uh, two records to help the system uh, to uh, achieve the acid property. And then how we are going to uh, I mean, record those records and, is, is, and essentially achieve those property will actually depend on what kind of modification or extension we did to the uh, buffer for management policy. Right? So like I said, it's going to be tightly uh, related to how we are going to uh, let the buffer for manager as well as the logging and recovery algorithm collaborate. All right? So any questions about the undo records and read records? Okay. <laughs> so uh, to give you a example, right, put, put everything into context uh, of, about the use case of a login and recovery. 
say, I mean, it's, it's a similar uh, thing that we had before, right? We have uh, two transactions, right? T1 and T2. And by the way, for uh, today's discussion purpose, we're just going to ignore all the concurrency control part, right? Just, we just assume that there will be some concurrency control mechanism, either uh, pessimistic or optimistic, that already I mean, help us to achieve the correct scheduling, right? We're just going to ignore the annotations for them, right? We're just only talking about uh, cases like power failure, okay? So again, two transactions, T1, T2, T1, read on A, write on A, T2, read on B, write on B. Assume that at the beginning, there's nothing in the buffer pool, and then, I mean, this, uh, this is a specific page on disk, all right? So at the beginning, when T1 starts, just, I mean, there's nothing in the buffer pool, the ZLB system would need to bring this uh, page into its buffer pool, right? And then perform this uh, read on A, all right? And, uh, and after that, let's say uh, T1 wants to modify the content of A, Right? So what it needs to do is that it needs to um, I mean, change the uh, value of A in this buffer per page, right? All right. <laughs> so after that, I mean, T2 is trying to read on B, and, but this page that contains record B is already in memory, right? So it just can't directly read that page. And after that, say uh, it just wants to change the value of B and change to 8, right? So at this point, right, T2 may want to commit. So here, we have to, in order to ensure our uh, the acid property, especially the durability property we talked about earlier, we probably want to write this page back onto the disk before we say this transaction is commit, right? Because otherwise, we could hit the power failure uh, scenario that we talked about earlier. If we didn't write this page onto the disk before we say this transaction is commit, then if there's a power failure in between, when the users come back to boot this database back up again, then it won't see the effect of, of this uh, transaction that has been committed, right? But the problem here is that not only this page has, has a modification for the record B, it also has the modification of, of record A, right? So if we flush this record onto the disk right now, then I mean, it would contain uh, the, this, um, this value of this uncommitted transaction A, all right? So let's say we do that, right? So we flush um, the, this page onto the disk. I mean, the B, of course, the value of B is already persistent on the non-volatile storage, but then there's also A there. And say, what if, I mean, the transaction N later on, either through a logical error or some internal state error, it needs to abort? So what, what do we do now? So <laughs> essentially, we need to roll back all the changes uh, of A, right? So of this first transaction, essentially this value of A. But then we already written uh, this record of B onto the disk, right? So depending on whether the buffer pool manager has, been, has evicted this uh, page uh, out of the buffer pool yet, right? If the page has already been evicted out of the buffer pool, then if we want to roll back the changes of A, we need to do a lot, lots of work, right? We have to first bring this page from the disk, I mean, back into the buffer pool, right? And then restore this value of A of, from three back to this original value, I think it's one or two, right? I forgot. And then write this page back onto the disk uh, again, right? So this is like a lot of overhead and you potentially want something smarter to deal with this, right? So any question with this example? No? Cool. <laughs> So to talk about uh, uh, different ways to deal with uh, this uh, buffer pool or modification to the buffer pool to help us, to help us achieve durability and automaticity, essentially we talk about uh, different um, policies right, or, or decisions that a system can make when uh, handling uh, those uh, pages about committed or aborted transaction, <laughs> okay? So the first decision right, or the policy we talk about is something called a stale policy, which is used to decide whether the system would be allowed to write to let uh, the or uncommitted transaction overwrite the value of committed transaction onto the uh, non volatile storage device, right? So essentially, if we it's similar to the earlier example, right? If we allow the uh, uncommitted transaction, which would be T1, to overwrite the value of A, right, onto the uh, non volatile storage before T1 even commit, that would be called a stale policy, right? So essentially, we stole those page from the buffer manager, uh, even though I mean, we haven't even committed. And uh, the other opposite would just be no stale policy, which means that we wouldn't allow that happen, right? We wouldn't allow a trans uncommitted transaction to write value onto the disk, right? That's one uh, decision point uh, that the system needs to uh, decide, okay? Another uh, very uh, important, I mean, a policy or like a decision point that a system need to make is something called whether it wants a forced policy, right? 
So force policy would essentially uh, decide whether the system would require the uh, changes of all, of all the uh, committed transaction to be uh, persistent on a non-volatile storage uh, before you tell the outside world that the transaction has committed, right? If we allow, sorry, if we have to have the database system to install all the changes of committed transaction to their corresponding changes, uh, pages on disk or the non-volatile non storage device, that will be called false, right? False to write before you commit. Otherwise, it's just called uh, non no false, right? There's also a, a very important uh, decision point that base system need to uh, make when handle a logging and recovery. Yes, please. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah, yeah, very good question. The question is whether this uh, policy is required the system to write to the, write the changes to the specific page, I mean, in the table, right, with all the content, or whether it's required uh, the system to write this page to some location, right? So the, the, the answer is that, this is actually getting ourselves a little bit ahead, a little bit ahead of time. We'll talk about the logging uh, later, but essentially the answer is, is the first, right? So the fourth policy only requires the system to write the values of the committed transaction to the specific page corresponding to the content of this, uh, this data records in the, in the data, right? So under a uh, false policy or, or no false policy, it, 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 essentially it doesn't specify whether the system would need to write that to a log or not. Right? So this is not, re not related to that, all right? Okay, and we'll talk about, for the people who don't, are not familiar with, with log records or logging, we'll talk about log soon, all right? So to better understand the trade-off between the different policies, right, I'm just going to give you uh, one example right, of the combination of these decisions called a no stale uh, plus false. Right? So let's see uh, what the database system would do under uh, this uh, combination of uh, decisions. Right? <laughs> so again, it's exactly the same uh, set of transactions, T1 and T2, right? read on A, write, write on A, read on B, write on B. Right? So again, the similar things. So first, there's nothing in the buffer pool, right? <laughs> and the, the database system would has have first have to bring the page into the buffer pool, right? And install the change on read on A, and then install the change on A, right? And then later on, transaction B comes along, sorry, transaction two comes along, and then read on B, and then write the value on B, right? So now, <laughs> transaction, so assume that transaction T2 is going to commit, okay? So what we are going to do here is that we assume we want to enforce a, or not enforce, because we already use this word false, right? We want to apply, say, right? We want to apply a no steal and false policy combination, okay? So what does this mean? Is that the database system will actually need to flush the changes of the second transaction T2 before it can say commit, right? So that's the requirement of false. But the, the policy no steal, if we want that policy decision, right? Would also means that we cannot write the change of the uncommitted transaction T1 uh, to the uh, corresponding page on the, uh, on the, no, the non-volatile storage device, right? So it essentially means that we both need to write this page out and, and, and cannot write this page out, right? <laughs> so what do, we, what do we need to do if we want to uh, enforce this policy? Well, one simple way, right, not necessarily the best way, right, what we potentially will talk about are better ways, but then one simple way to handle this is that uh, we could actually uh, make a copy of this page, right? With only the modifications from the committed transaction, which would be uh, T2 at this point, right? And after we make this copy, we can write the values of all this uh, copied page with the committed transaction back to disk, right? And then we can still keep this um, uh, original uh, modified page uh, in, in the memory buffer with the values of the uncommitted transaction, right? Say, after a while, uh, we realize that transaction T1 needs to abort, <laughs> then it's actually a very trivial to roll back the change of this transaction T1, right? Because right now, we, we only need to, I mean, go come back to this uh, dirty uh, page in the buffer pool to flip this value of uh, a, a from three back to a one, and then we don't need to do anything else, right? So, so we essentially, uh, this, uh, what is it called, um, guarantee this automaticity or rollback is easy. And actually, when there's, if there's a power failure in between, right, it's actually also very easy to guarantee the automaticity when the database system comes back again, right? Because 
all the uh, changes on the disk on my persistent non-volatile storage device would only contain the values from a committed transaction, right? So it's very easy to roll back and very easy to uh, recover to guarantee automaticity when you come back from a power failure. Make sense? <laughs> but what would be the uh, potential issues with this approach, right? Any idea? So essentially, it's kind of obvious, right? So what we are trying to do here is that, or what we did here is that every time we are trying to write something onto the disk or we try to commit a transaction, we have to make a copy right, of this entire page, right? assuming that there, there may be some uh, values from uncommitted transaction. Right? So this copy would requires, uh, requires, requires work. Right? <laughs> and the second of all is that even though, I mean, at this point, uh, we don't need to uh, write this page uh, multiple times when uh, later on uh, we, we have to, sorry, even though we need to read this page back again into memory on like the, the first uh, simple scenario, right? But in this case, we may still need to write a single page multiple times to a disk. Right? Because like, a, like a, we, we look at earlier, right? In this time, when transaction B commits, we need to write this uh, page to disk again, to, to, to disk um, for the first time, right? Assuming that later on, the transaction, transaction one is not a bot, right? Assuming later on the transaction one actually commits, then we actually need to write this uh, page back to a disk again, right? So that's uh, quite some uh, write amplification there. And the third of all, what is probably a bigger problem is that we actually, in this case, we, we need, in fact, keep the uh, pages of all the uh, transactions. So we have to keep the pages of the, all the uh, values modified by a committing transaction in memory before it is trying to commit, right? Because we, we don't allow a stale here and we need to force uh, the, all the pages and on, on disk for the committed transaction. So essentially, when every, before every transaction commit, we had to make a copy of all the changes of this uh, transaction, uh, 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 or, yeah, make, make copies on the pages uh, with, with the changes of, of this transaction and we make copies for, for everything. And then we have to write all these pages at once onto the disk, right? But then assuming a scenario where the database system, uh, sorry, the, the transaction needs to modify lots of lots of pages uh, uh, on, in, in the database, then in that case, the buffer pool may not even be big enough, right? There may not be enough room for the transaction to make a copy of all the pages that it has modified. So in that case, the transaction can't even commit. And, and furthermore, uh, for many systems, there may not even a mechanism for the transaction to commit or to write the content of many pages it has modified onto the disk together, right? Say a transaction may modify uh, values from three pages, three pages in the content of your database, then we're trying to commit, what if you, 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 you experience a power failure after the transaction has written the first one or two pages onto disk, but has not written the third page onto disk, right? Then you still have, would may face the issue of when you come back from a power failure, I mean, there's a partial change from this committed transaction that you have not written to the disk yet, right? So there are actually uh, lots of, still lots of issues with this uh, simple policy uh, that would either um, slow down the performance of the system or even limit the functionality of the system, right? Unless you have some uh, special uh, hardware instruction support. That makes sense? Cool. <laughs> so uh, this pretty much just to summarize uh, what, we, uh, what I talk about, right? Just in written form. So with this uh, simple, uh, easy algorithm uh, for uh, no stale and false, uh, you don't have to have any undo log, right? Because uh, you just don't write the uh, changes of uncommitted transaction uh, onto the disk. And similarly, you don't need to have a redo log records either, actually, <laughs> right? Because uh, in this case, for all the things, um, for all, all the changes of committed transaction, you will write them onto the disk, assuming you can, right? Before you say commit. But then there are uh, lots of uh, performance implementation and as well as the functionality limitations that this mechanism can bring, right? Especially if you have a transaction that has written lots of pages that exceeds the size of the buffer pool, then you just cannot deal with that, right? So a, a variant of this approach we actually uh, kind of talk about this a little bit when we talk about the uh, fundamental acid property. It's called shadow paging, right? So it makes this a little bit better, uh, but again, we'll, we'll see it also has its own limitation, right? So essentially, 
what the shadow paging can help address is the uh, function limitation part, right? It can is essentially a way uh, extension of this uh, simple uh, copying uh, mechanism we talked about earlier, so that you can actually um, install changes uh, that are bigger than the buffer pool size, right? With this shadow paging approach, right? It's kind of like an incremental uh, copying approach. So essentially, in the, under shadow paging, you are maintaining two copies of the entire database, right? One is called master copy and one is called shadow copy, and you will just up, up, apply all the changes from the uncommitted transaction to the shadow copy, right? And when the transaction wants to commit, you'll just uh, flip those two copies around, switch a pointer, and then let the database to point into the shadow page, and then your master page, sorry, and then you clean up the original records in your, in your original master copy, right? Uh, and uh, this would actually uh, help us, again, to achieve the um, no steal and false policy. Would make the recovery pretty easy, right? No need to redo, and no need to undo, right? Okay, so uh, here in this, uh, we'll walk through the uh, specific steps, right? But at high level, that's the data structure you need to maintain with this uh, shadow paging mechanism. So uh, essentially, for shadow paging, you actually have a specific page, both on disk and in, mem and, and in memory, to store the pointer of the root of the database, right? And you will use that to control uh, which version of the database, either the master version or the shadow version that you are going to use. <laughs> and then with the in-memory, uh, as well as on disk, you will have uh, this uh, page table to point into what will be the uh, current version of each page that the database system is using right now, right? Again, for each page, there could be, it could be its master version or it could be its uh, shadow paging version, right? Depending on what modification the database system ha have done. So uh, just at a high level, right, to install uh, any change to into the database system, the, the system would actually overwrite all the uh, shadow page, right, that, that, uh, that the database copied for the uh, current uh, running transaction, right, and then switch the pointers I talked about earlier, right, for each page from the original master copy to the new copy. And lastly, right, the system will organize, um, typically they will organize the, um, the page table, right, for or to, the, to maintain the pointers to uh, different pages in a data structure uh, usually is maintained in a, in a tree structure, right? So lastly, uh, when all the changes are done, it will just overwrite the root pointer of this tree, right, to point into the uh, new copy of the database or the shadow copy of the database, right? So let, let me give you a specific illustration of this. So here, again, that we we just assuming that the database system uh, has this uh, has this uh, root page and then have these several pages on the disk as well as the uh, current page table or called master page table that are pointing to uh, the corresponding pages onto the disk uh, all the master versions right pointing to them one by one okay say there's a transaction uh, transaction T1 comes along right what it needs to do is that it first need to make an entire copy right it needs to make an entire copy of this uh, shadow page table, right? Of this master page table, and it would call the uh, shadow page table, right? Pointing to uh, the, all the shadow pages. But at the beginning, because this transaction has not made, has not made any changes, all this pointer will just point into the original master copy, all right? <laughs> and then when the transaction uh, needs to uh, install any changes, it will just uh, apply the uh, changes to this, uh, to the copies, of the records onto the disk, uh, and then flip the pointer in the shadow page table to point into the new page that contains the modification. Right? And that's for the uh, transaction that will modify these pages, and for read-only transaction, right? it, it will just read the uh, copies from the master, uh, mas master page table and to read the original master copy. Right? So here, assume that this transaction T1 would update uh, the uh, record in the uh, first page, right? What you need to do is that you will first make a copy of the uh, page uh, that contains that record on disk, right? And then just to flip the pointer in the shadow page table uh, for that page from the original master copy to the uh, this new uh, shadow page on disk, right? And similarly, if it needs to uh, modify the other records, and then it will make a copy of the page that contains the record uh, on disk, and then uh, flip the pointer uh, in the shadow page table, right? And assume that it needs to apply another record again. So lastly, when the transaction uh, wants to commit, what it wants to do is that it will just essentially, right, update this value in this database uh, root page, right? So instead of pointing uh, to the original master page table, 
now the database root page will just have a pointer pointing to uh, the uh, shadow page table. And then, I mean, even though, and so assuming that the database system crash after a while, right, when it comes back, it will just realize that, hey, the database root is already pointing to the uh, new page table, and then everything would still be correct, right? And of course, I mean, after that, you need to uh, clean up all the uh, unlisted records uh, in the original uh, master copy, right? Because, I mean, they are not useful anymore, right? So any uh, uh, questions on this? Yes, please. Yeah. But commit before T1. Uh, right. Then how does that actually work? So we would copy T1 characters table? <laughs> like we need to not keep all the changes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Essentially, uh, the question is that what if there are transactions that, essentially, what about concurrency control, right? What if there are transactions modified in the same records, no matter who first, who second, et cetera, right? <laughs> so, yeah, there are, that's actually one type of problem uh, with shadow paging that I'll talk about but later, but since you already brought it up, there are different ways to deal with that. One simple way to deal with that is that you only allow one writing transaction, right? So this will limit the concurrency of your scheduling to be one writing transaction at a time, and you don't have that issue. Of course, that would uh, have lots of performance in implementation, right? That's one problem. Another problem, well, sorry, potential solution is that you would, you could allow multiple writing transactions, then you need additional mechanism to keep track of which transaction modified which page, right? make a copy of which page, and if uh, there are some uh, different transactions that modify the same page, one transaction already commit, right? flip the pointer, and the second transaction may not even be able to commit, right? have to abort that. Of course, there are performance implications of that as well. Right? Yes, please. On the same question, sorry. Yeah. Um, if we want to delete pages on disk, do we need some kind of record counting to keep track of how many counter page tables are pointing to yeah, so the question is, what if we want to delete a page? Do we need shadow mechanism to keep track of the num the counter of the page? Uh, let's see. <laughs> again, I think it depends on the mechanism, right? So again, if you only allow one writing transaction, I don't think you need that, right? Because yeah, I mean, only one transaction modify, and then other transaction can only read, right? If you if you allow concurrent writing, then I think yes. Yeah, yeah. You need additional mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? All right. Okay. So a uh, little bit similar to the benefit of the earlier uh, like straightforward copying approach, the, the, the benefit of the shadow paging is that uh, undo and regroup would be very, very easy, right? Essentially, uh, it's very easy to roll back the changes of uncommitted transaction Essentially, you just blow away all the shadow page table as well as the record on your shadow page on the disk, right? It's also very easy to come back from recovery because, uh, yeah, like if, if there's a power failure and you have not flipped the pointer yet, then none of the changes would be in effect, right? So you, do, you, you, will, you would still have an original copy of the master version of the database intact, right? And you just, only thing you need to do would be clean up all the additional uh, shadow records. Again, okay, but, but uh, similar to uh, the uh, other like, simple mechanism example, uh, with this, um, this uh, shadow paging, and also a little bit related to what we have just discussed, there are quite, quite some uh, disadvantages, right? <laughs> so the first it is disadvantage is that, actually, before you uh, start any write uh, on this uh, uh, with a transaction, you would first need to copy the entire page table. Right? Otherwise, you cannot just do the shadow paging, the pointer switching, and then flee, and then uh, switch to the uh, new uh, shadow copy of the database with only one uh, root page pointer switching. Right? And of course, you can go a little bit smarter with that. Right? You, can, you can sort of do a shadow paging on the uh, page table in memory, right? but, but still, you, you have to copy the, uh, some, at least quite some uh, records in the page table right, in order to do the managing all the shadow pages. And of course, you have to copy the shadow pages themselves as well, right? And other uh, disadvantage, especially problem with commit, is that one problem is that, uh, that's actually the last uh, bullet list here, right? There are some issues that they need to have to deal with uh, that have performance implementation when you're trying to commit, but there are also other problems, right? Because, for example, uh, the first problem, uh, every time when you uh, want to uh, modify the database, you have to uh, do a lot of random modifications, right? Either in the pages, right, in the, from the database, right, from either the shadow page uh, or that you need to copy, right, 
all this page table, right? Because that's also lots of pages that you need to change. And then those pages uh, could reside on many different places on disk, right? So you, you, that would involve a lot of random writes, I mean, random re uh, writings of those pages that could potentially be uh, very slow. And the second of all is that while you are doing those uh, shadow uh, paging copying uh, techniques, you, again, you would make uh, copies of a lot of pages in a database content to various random locations, right? So the data on our database or stored in our database would become very uh, defragmented. For example, assume that you have a clustered index originally, right? Your database, the records may all sort out on this, right? And, and then laid out nicely, right? Increasing or decreasing one after the other. But after a while, right, if you, after you apply the shadow paging, I mean, those different copies of the pages would just all over the place, right? If you want to do perform a, uh, a, a sequential scan on the table, then especially if you want to follow in certain order, then those pages would not be in order at all, right? So lots of defragmentation and also potentially lead a performance penalty. And furthermore, you need, also need to collect the garbage, right? Essentially, there could be lots of um, garbage either from the uh, original master copy that is no longer useful or from the shadow pages of uncommitted transaction. You have to clean all of them up. And then we talk about the uh, transaction, tra the transaction committing performance limitation as well. So, one system that uh, does use, so, so, so at high level, right, people or uh, existing they have a system rarely use uh, the technique, uh, uh, this shadow paging technique to achieve login and recovery. Uh, for the original simple uh, copying uh, method that I talked about like at the beginning of the class, as far as I know, nobody do like a simple things like that, right, because it's just uh, uh, too costly and with the performance, or, and performance and functionality Im limitation. For the shadow paging, uh, because of many uh, disadvantages we talk about, a system rarely use that, but there are certain systems uh, still use that in specific scenarios. So, uh, in fact, when the very beginning of the database uh, uh, industry, we talk about system R, right? That's the very first database system implementation uh, from IBM, IBM Research. Initially, they actually use shadow paging, right? Again, because I mean, undoing records, I roll back transactions, and recovery, they are all easy. But then later on, they figure out that there are lots of performance implementation, implication. They are switched to another logging mechanism we are going to talk about now. Similarly, with the, another very famous system, a SQLite, they actually uh, start with using a technique, not exactly shadow paging, but something very similar to shadow paging at the beginning. Right? Again, it's more straightforward, easier to implement, uh, but later on, after around 2010, they also switched to a, a logging-based mechanism we are going to talk about next. Right? But just to quickly talk about the um, initial variant uh, about shadow paging that SQLite uh, applied um, in first, is essentially a technique called uh, journaling. Right? So a little bit, little bit different from shadow, shadow paging, where you uh, make copies before you modify a page, uh, modify a page with this journaling, journaling technique from SQLite, what they will do is that before modifying a specific page, they will actually make a copy of the original value of those page onto a separate journaling file, right? Make, the, or make additional copy of the original version instead of new version. And then they will actually modify the values of the, of the uh, records in those pages in place when some uh, transaction needs to change them, right? And then when transaction wants to commit, of course, it, it will just uh, commit, right? And then uh, after, uh, if there's a power failure, right? Assuming that uh, the system crash, after restarting, only if there's a general file exist, the database system would actually need to uh, undo all the changes of the uncommitted transactions from this journaling file stored on a separate storage device, right? Otherwise, it will just uh, keep continue. So it's kind of like, um, a, a opposite or conjugate method uh, from uh, shadow paging, right? But uh, the intuition is similar. So let me give you a quick example for this. Say here, right, we have uh, three pages in memory and then uh, there are many pages on disk and there's a separate general in file, right? Say I have a transaction that want to make a modification on this page two, right? So what SQLite would do, uh, sim uh, like a little bit different from uh, uh, shadow paging is that it will make a copy of the original value of page two. Right? And then it'll just go ahead and, and modify page two, let's say uh, uh, two prime. And similarly, like if it wants to modify page three, uh, make a copy of the original version of the page three onto the journaling file, and then make the copy here. So uh, modify uh, this uh, page three here, right? three prime. 
and then uh, say the transaction wants to commit, right? It will just, uh, I mean, write write the value of this uh, modified page onto the disk, right? <laughs> but assuming that here there's a power failure, right? And before the transaction is able to commit, uh, I mean, the system crash, and then after a while the system comes back uh, to memory again, right? Of course, when that happens, nothing, I mean, in memory would still exist, right? And then there would be a, a, a dirty, dirty record, right, or, the, or a page with uncommitted, uh, with values from uncommitted transaction on page two, right? So what uh, SQLite would do in this case is that it would just look at the journaling file and see that, hey, there are actually journals from the uh, uncommitted transaction uh, in my journaling file. And it would just uh, restore the value uh, from this uh, original copy of, uh, of these uh, journal uh, page files and then restore them uh, back into the, uh, onto the uh, disk that stores the content of the actual data, right? So a little bit similar to uh, shadow paging, but uh, slightly, also I mean, kind of slightly different in how they handle that. But at the end of the day, SQLite to move on to a logging approach as well, which, which would be uh, more performant. All right, any question? Cool. Yeah, this is just like pretty sweet. Okay, so one fundamental, um, of course, with this shadow paging approach, right, you don't really have the limitation of the database system needs to uh, have a big enough buffer pool to store all the modification of the changes of the transaction anymore, right, because you can incrementally write uh, changes to the copies of, I mean, or with these shadow pages. But one fundamental performance limitation of this shadow paging approach is that at the end of the day, you still need to um, either copy, right, or uh, look up many of these uh, random pages onto the, on, on the disk, right, and modify these pages in random locations, either from the content of the, of the database or from these uh, page tables, right, and then write out those changes uh, when you commit the transaction, again, in a random fashion. And then we know that uh, random disk writes is very, very costly, right? So, one, 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 one central idea that we want to apply here to improve the performance of the database system or improve the efficiency of logging and query is that we actually want to make uh, the, our writes of the database system as sequential as possible, right? Essentially, we want to record the changes of different transactions and the metadata about these transactions, I mean, later on, if we want to recover, and we want to write those changes onto disk as sequential as possible, right? So that, I mean, we reduce the number of random writes and that can significantly increase, improve the performance of the system. And that's this one fundamental thing we want to achieve. And another thing we also want to achieve is that with those shadow paging, or, or with this uh, shadow paging, uh, technique, one important limitation is that they are going to modify one page at a time, right? So even though you only, modi only modify one record in a page under this, under this shadow paging technique, at the end of the day, you will still need to write the entire shadow page out to disk, right? So that's also kind of costly. That's another uh, performance uh, limitation that we want to uh, get rid of as well, right, to improve the performance. So <laughs> the uh, technique that we are applying here to help us uh, to uh, achieve uh, this performance improvement and get rid of the earlier performance implementation will be called right head logging, right? <laughs> so essentially, the idea is that before the transaction commits, we are going to write the changes made by this uh, transaction, including all the metadata, right? The information about read records, under records, et cetera. We'll talk about details later. But anyway, write out all those changes of that transaction sequentially on a log file, right, before we want to commit that transaction. And in that case, uh, we don't actually uh, need uh, to, to write to the different, different random locations on disk uh, about the actual content uh, anymore, right? And then if there's a power failure, or if we want to roll back those changes, for example, if we have a power failure, right, we are just going to look back into this uh, log file and see what we want to restore, uh, et cetera. And then also, we, what we want to achieve is that we want to achieve a stale and no false policy, right? Essentially, by uh, this approach, we actually want to be able to write out uh, the changes of uncommitted transaction onto disk before waiting uh, this page is, has, has a, we have a clean page or the transaction has been committed. Oh, and also we want to, want to have a no false policy as well, right? So uh, essentially, we, want to, uh, we don't want to uh, wait for the 
Bounce Manager to evict all the pages of a transaction, uh, that, have, that all the pages that has uh, records modified by a committing transaction. We don't want to wait Buffer Pool Manager to flush all those pages onto disk before we can commit, because we have these uh, log records sequentially written onto the disk. And then, again, the uh, most important thing that this uh, right header logging need to guarantee is that it needs to write out all those changes, these modifications sequentially onto the disk before the transaction can commit, right? Or before, in other words, before the transaction can write out the actual content, the page that contains the actual content of the transaction back onto the original location on the disk, right? Or the otherwise, if you uh, already modify a transaction in this original uh, location, or you already, uh, already modify the content there, but then you haven't really have the records in the log yet, then after uh, a crash, after a recovery from the crash, then only by examining this, uh, this data on the log record, you are not going to restore the database system in the correct state, right? So that's what we essentially uh, want to guarantee, right? We want to, we want to make sure that everything that we are going to uh, persist on the disk would be reflected in the uh, log file uh, early, okay? That's why we call it uh, right header logging, okay? Well, again, this is a little bit abstract, but we will see uh, more examples uh, later. So hopefully it will become more clear. So the uh, basic protocol to uh, achieve uh, this uh, log, uh, red header logging, okay? So uh, the way we are going to do that is that when the database that that system is going to uh, modify any uh, records, what we will do is that instead of first make the modification on the original page that contains that record, it will actually write that modification on a separate log record, right? And then in this case, it doesn't need to write the content of the entire page. It only needs to write to the log record about whatever it changes, okay? And then when, uh, before this uh, transaction uh, is trying to commit or overwrite the uh, changes uh, of these, uh, of, of these uh, modified records, onto the uh, pages in the, about the database content, what we will do is that it will first make sure that all the log records are flushed on the disk, right? And then so that later on, if there's a, a crash, it can come back and see what's content in the, in the log record. And then when the transaction is trying to commit, it only needs to make sure that all the pages that contains uh, the uh, log records would actually be uh, flushed out or written to the disk, right? It doesn't need to ensure that the uh, modification uh, in the pages that contains the uh, actual record in the database content uh, to be flushed onto the disk. It doesn't need to ensure that. Essentially, uh, we would allow no false policy. All right? So, so trying to give you a more a concrete specification, and again, uh, after this, I will show you examples, is that every time when a transaction begin, it first needs to uh, tell the database system that um, transaction already starts, right? So at that po at that point, it needs to write a begin record uh, into the uh, into the log file. Again, doesn't specify when it needs to flush uh, that uh, begin log record onto disk yet, right? At this point, it, the begin record may still in memory. Okay, and then when a transaction finishes, what it will do is that it will write or append a commit log record at the end of the log file, and then it will need to ensure that all the modifications, right? All the uh, log records that contains the changes made by this transaction all flush to the disk, right? That would include the begin records, as well as all the modification, I mean, re re written uh, in the log records in between, as well as this, this, as well as this uh, final commit record. It will ensure all this record written onto the disk, hopefully in a sequential manner, right? Before it can tell uh, the outside world or the client the transaction has commit. And then again, Note that it doesn't specify that the uh, dirty page that contains the uh, modification of this transaction to the actual content of the database system uh, needs to be uh, uh, written to the disk, right? It doesn't uh, force that. All right, make sense? Cool. So uh, at a high level, right? So what would be uh, inside every log record uh, of this uh, right header logging mechanism? Essentially, I mean, it, there are, there are actually in, in the implementation level, right? There are um, much more metadata that you need to maintain, but at a high level, at a logical level, right? What needs to uh, contain in a log record would be first, which transaction it is, right? Kind of straightforward transaction ID here in this case. And as well as 
which object it is trying to modify, right? This could, mostly, most of the time, this will be an identifier for the uh, tuple, right? For example, a page slot number. And then it will have the uh, original value of this uh, particular object, say a tuple, before the transaction modified it, used for the purpose of undo the changes of this transaction if it aborts, right? And lastly, it will have the new value of this object, say the tuple, I mean, after the modification of your transaction and the purpose of this redo record or after value would be to reapply any changes of the transaction if the transaction commits, but then uh, there's a power failure and the, the database system has not written the dirty pages of this transaction to the disk yet. All right, it makes, makes sense all, all those information before and after value, what, what are the purpose? So here, finally, uh, we can give you a specific example, right? <laughs> Say, I mean, for simply, I mean, for demonstration purpose, I just have a very simple example where we have one transaction, just a write two value, okay? And then initially we have an empty uh, buffer buffer pool, and then oh, sorry, here I'm, I'm showing you that the buffer pool already brought in this uh, page uh, into main memory, and then at the beginning we we have a uh, empty uh, log record buffer, right? Because I mean, you have to have a buffer to store those log records before you can write them onto the disk, right? So that's kind of straightforward. So at the beginning, I mean, when the, this transaction begins, it will first install a begin log record into the uh, uh, write header log buffer, right? To indicate the system, hey, I mean, there's a transaction that already starts. And then, I mean, there's a write on A, and then it will just, uh, transaction will just uh, uh, install a uh, log records into the Red Hat log buffer about this modification. And it has the transaction ID, the object ID, as well as the before and after value of this uh, specific object, right? So say a tuple. And then in the buffer pool, I mean, uh, for, oh, there, uh, there's a specific reason uh, for that we have to, have to first Make the uh, make the modification in the uh, right head log uh, record, and then we make this uh, modification in the buffer pool later, uh, which I will get to the which I will talk about in detail next class. But here, I mean, let me just uh, for demonstration purpose, we just need to know that we first need to write this record in the right head log buffer. Then later on, after when the log record has been created, we are going to make the modification in the original buffer pool, right? We talked about earlier in this course uh, and made the modification of this record A from one to eight, right? And then essentially we have a new dirty page in the buffer pool, uh, okay? And then later on, we have this uh, new uh, write, I mean write on B, and similarly, we are going to install a new log record in the red hat log uh, buffer, right? Has the before value, after value, and the other metadata information, and then we are going to make the modification on this uh, buffer pool, right? Okay, makes sense. And later on, transaction commits, then we don't need to make modification in the buffer pool anymore. We're just going to install a commit log records in this uh, buffer pool object, all right? And then now what we can do is that instead of doing this random writes with all, those, all the pages that the transaction has touches, touches, we're just going to write out all these log records that only contains the, the values of the specific tuples that this transaction has modified and write them sequentially onto the disk at once, right? Which would be potentially be uh, much more efficient than the uh, earlier uh, page copying thing uh, we talk about with the shadow page. All right. Then now, I mean, after uh, this uh, modification, sorry, after this uh, sequential write, uh, this uh, transaction can just uh, safely commit. Right? We can tell the outside world, "Hey, the transaction has finished." And even though we still have the dirty page down there. But even, but if a transaction, I mean, oh sorry, if the system crash right now, we still have the log records written on the disk that we can I mean, find back the, the values of this committed transaction even with a power failure, right? So this whole thing or the, or the state of the database system would still be uh, correct. All right, cool. Yeah, there's this transaction commit. Yeah, then I, I mean, I'm similar, just to illustrate what I said, right? If there's a power failure, we can still uh, look at everything onto the disk here, right? So uh, there are a few uh, interesting questions or like clarifications we can look into uh, uh, about this Red Hat logging. The first question would be that when should the have a system to write a log rate entries onto the disk, all right? So the answer, well, I mean, first, obviously, that 
you, you, you would need to write all the log records onto the disk when transaction commits, right? Because otherwise, you cannot guarantee uh, the uh, durability uh, property. <laughs> but there's nothing preventing the system to write some of the log records onto disk earlier, right? If the system will figure out, hey, uh, there are already enough records in the pages, so I'm already, I'm already going to be perform a big enough sequential write onto the disk, and that, I mean, that would just, uh, uh, would have worse these uh, with the one round trip to the disk, even though the transaction has not committed yet. I mean, you, yeah, you can always write uh, things earlier, right? I mean, uh, and and if uh, if um, the if the system realizes that it's going to uh, it's going to worth it, right? And then second of all, even though I mean we talk about that we can write the changes of the entire transaction onto the disk one at a time, there could still be cases that you may have uh, many short transactions, right? So each transaction may not modify many, many pages, or maybe just uh, modify one record, right? In that case, even though we could commit or write the changes of all, of all uh, the transactions every time when a transaction commits, if, if each transaction only modify, modify a small number of records, there may still be lots of uh, random writes, right? So another thing what we could do is that we could actually um, batch, or in our, in our words, group the commits of multiple transactions together, right? So that, again, we would have a big enough, a chunk of big enough log records in memory so that we can write the uh, changes of many transactions together onto disk in a sequential manner, right, to amortize our cost. But again, or like similar to the um, example I gave earlier with the sequential writes, this, this uh, disadvantage or potential disadvantage of this approach is that each transaction needs to wait a little bit before it can commit, right? Because before you write out the commit records and all the changes of a transaction on the disk, you cannot tell the outside world you have commit, right? So if you want to use this group commit approach, you have to let a set of transaction to wait until the log records is big enough or a certain time has passed, write the changes of all the transactions on the disk, and then you can tell the clients that they issued all these transactions together that everything has committed, right? So if some transaction executed earlier, you have to wait. But then again, it could amortize the cost of many uh, potential random writes, all right? So uh, actually, with this, with this approach, uh, one thing to note here is that even though that some certain transaction did not commit, right? Like I mentioned uh, earlier, you could actually still write their change if the time window has, has passed, if you realize all, if you realize that uh, you have written a big enough log record so that a round trip to the disk would worth it. So let's give you an example here, right? To combine these two concepts. Say you have uh, the uh, two transactions, transaction T1 and T2, right? Do need some modification, and then uh, just uh, quickly go through transaction one begin, have a begin record, and then uh, transaction one can have a write operation, create a record for that, and then transaction one can have another write record, right? So say here that uh, something happened and transaction one is stored because of some uh, other operation is performing, we do the context switch uh, to transaction T2, right? Then on the group commit, we can actually start to write uh, T2 already, right? Then I mean, T2, say here, have a begin timestamp directly append to the same uh, log buffer, and then, for example, it can write uh, the value of C, sorry, the changes of the value of the C as well as uh, the changes, uh, yeah, it can already write the changes of the C here, right? See, now, for example, the SysDB system already uh, realized that this log record is already big enough, right? Then it can actually already start to flush this record to disk, right? It doesn't really need to wait for either T1 or T2 uh, commit, or it doesn't need to wait for a specific time either, right? It can just directly write this uh, big enough record sequentially onto the disk already. And later on, right, say uh, the transaction D2 uh, comes back and then uh, write the log record uh, of this, uh, this uh, record D or tuple D onto the second, uh, second uh, uh, buffer pool, uh, right, right ahead log buffer. And then say after that, both T1 and T2 has stalled, right? Again, because I mean, some other reason, maybe T1 or T2 are performing some read operation that is waiting for some other records to be brought into the buffer pool, right? Or it's just some other uh, expensive, perform uh, expensive operation they are performing. And then, if certain time has passed, right, if there's like a periodic time that the database system can keep track of to, to uh, write uh, the log records in batch, if that time has passed, 
it can still write this uh, new uh, batch of log records onto the disk, even though there may not be many records already. Right? So that, that's totally fine. And I mean, even though this T1 and T2 has not commit, but in the log records, we will know that T1 and T2 has not commit anyway. Right? We are not writing uh, commit records for, for those T1 and T2 transactions in advance. So that would be uh, totally fine as well. Right? So you can totally write this record as well. Any questions with this uh, timing of uh, writing uh, log records as well as uh, the concept of group commit? Okay. All right, so the uh, next question I need to uh, clarify a little bit is that when should they have a system to write the dirty records, right? To actually contain the modification uh, of the transactions in the pages of the database content right to the disk, right? So when do the database system need to do that? Well, actually, the answer is that it, it actually do that anytime, actually, right? As long as the database system ensure that it first write the uh, values, sorry, write the log records that contains those modifications uh, the, the transaction made uh, onto the disk, right? As long as the, the database system ensure the flush of those log records first, then for the dirty pages, the system can, can write at any time, right? When the transaction is executing, when the transaction commits, or after the transaction commit, doesn't matter, right? Whenever the database system has the cycle as well as the hardware resource to do that, I mean, they are all fine, all right? So to uh, summarize a little bit uh, of the trade-off between uh, the uh, different combinations of these uh, stale and false policies, right? So in the earlier shadow paging example, right, we have this uh, combination of this uh, false and no stale, right? So essentially, we are going to let or to ensure the changes of all the committed transactions to onto the disk, right, in the pages of the content of the database before we can commit the transaction. As well as, again, shadow paging, right, we are going to, we are not allow the any changes of uncommitted transactions uh, to be uh, persistent on the uh, number hotel uh, storage device. And with that, it will actually have the uh, fastest, sorry, slowest uh, runtime performance, right? Because you have to make copies, randomize, et cetera. But then it's very easy to unroll things and it's very fast to do recovery. Because, I mean, once you do recovery, you only need to read all the pages from a disk back into memory, right? I mean, everything there would be uh, committed and then uh, they, all, everything would be correct. On the other hand, right, with Red Hat logging, what we are achieving is this uh, no false and a stale combination. Right? With that, we have um, faster runtime, especially because we only need to store the changes of the modification of the transaction on the tuples, not the other pages, as well as we can sequentially write things onto the disk. But then at the recovery time, when things crash, we, have, we actually have to look at the log records onto the disk, right? Because we have not propagate, propagate the modification of the transaction on their original location, the database content yet, right? We have to look at look through all those logs and then apply the uh, corresponding operations to restore the changes of uncommitted transaction, et cetera, to make sure things are correct. And we'll talk about um, the recovery protocol uh, next class, right? But essentially, at the recovery time, it will be uh, pretty, uh, it will be relatively slow, much slower. But that said, in practice, right, this is actually a very important comment <laughs> I want to make here. In practice, 99% of the time, people would prefer faster runtime performance comparing to uh, the faster recovery performance. And the reason is simply that recovery in most of most applications, sorry, crash in most uh, applications would be rare, right? So there would be very little chances. You would need to actually apply this uh, expensive recovery procedure, even though you use approach uh, like Red Hat logging, right? So most, most of the time, you just want to optimize for the common case when the database is running to make sure that things are faster there, and then you deal with the expensive recovery when it happens. And in most cases, it doesn't happen that often. Right? But again, there are actually scenarios uh, where uh, the recovery or the, the crash of the database system may happen often, and in that case, it may be more beneficial to use a shadow paging approach. In fact, there's one example I heard from my advisor, Andy, that many years ago, right, there, there was actually a, um, some sort of electricity company down to Costa Rica uh, 
where the the power there, right? Or the or the actually it's like a phone company, right? But the the power there is actually not stable at all. Essentially, uh, the uh, power that uh, that the provided to the database system will actually uh, be uh, stop be stopped once every few hours, something like that, right? So the database system may in, you know, in be in a constant state where it, it will crash, and then you have to bring it back up again, right? For example, every few hours. And in that case, it might actually be better to use a approach like a shadow paging, right, with a false and no stale, so that you optimize for the recovery time instead of a runtime. But again, as you can imagine, that's actually kind of rare. Most systems would use right ahead logging to optimize for the other, okay? So last a few minutes to quickly go through uh, what will be the uh, content uh, uh, to retain in those log records. Uh, we talk about the at high level, uh, like, like the before value, after value, transaction ID, object ID, etc. Right. But then for the specific implementation, there are a few uh, different choices as well. <laughs> so the uh, first choice would be called a physical logging, which means that you 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 are going to uh, record the exact change that a transaction made onto, a, onto the disk, right? So uh, one way to think about this is that think about the diff command uh, in Git, right? So that's exactly what change on which line in this uh, page uh, of, of the content, and then you're just going to uh, store that. And the other type of uh, content you can, you, can, you can record in your login, we call logical login, right? We essentially, instead of to record the exact change uh, of that transaction on every pages or on all the tuples. Assume that uh, you, your transaction may modify a billion tuples, right? Then there will be a billion records you need to record in the first place with the first approach. The second approach, you only actually record at logically what this transaction did. And in, in many cases, this will just be the SQL command of the transaction, right? Essentially, you just record the original SQL command, let's say update, I mean, this table uh, with all the values a equals to a plus one, right? Something like that, and then you will just replay that command uh, when you want to, um, uh, I mean, recover, say, as they uh, redo this uh, this login. So a uh, little bit about the uh, trade-off. So we kind of already talk about that with logical logging, right? For example, you only record a command that modify the content of a billion tuple. Then obviously you are going to write much less data, right? Comparing to the physical logging, you write all the contents. But in actuality. People, almost nobody used the second logical logging approach, right? Uh, again, there are there are extreme exceptions, but in actuality, nobody, almost almost nobody used the uh, logical logging approach, simply because with logical logging approach, it's very difficult to determine which part of the content of that database system is modified by which query and in which order. Because right, you remember with, with the transactions, concurrency control, we can interleaving queries, queries have interleaving op operations. It's very difficult to keep track of all those things and then restore the database system in a correct state, uh, page by page, right? So, and this one uh, did, uh, challenge. And the second challenge is that, or probably uh, more importantly, is that with logical logging, you have to re-execute all the operations of that transaction as well, right? Say you have a transaction that has expensive join, join 10 tables, you have to re-execute the entire, uh, entire join query again with this logical logging, right? That would also be very expensive. So in practice, what people do is essentially a modification or slightly tweak of physical logging called a physiological logging. So I would say this is more close to physical logging than logical logging, right? So essentially what it does is that it will actually uh, combine, uh, it will, well, essentially it will modify or record changes of a transaction at uh, the page level, but instead of record the exact change, right, at which location uh, this value is changed from what to what, it will only record at a high level, uh, let's say, what records have been modified uh, in this page, right, and what's the before and what's after. And after, say, there's a recovery, you need to reapply this change, the database actually would have the freedom to I mean, reinstall or reapply uh, the values of this record back into the page, but it doesn't need to write the value in the specific location, right? It can uh, freely reorganize the location of all the pages as it wants, clean up the empty pages, sorry, clean up the empty slots in the page, et cetera, and then uh, to restore all the changes of the tuple, right? So give you an example here, right? With a logical, and say we have this transaction, it's update uh, this value, right? It's like a set value is equal to x, y, z. Then with the physical login, 
what you do is that it will just record the table and the page and then specific offset of that value, right, and before and after. And by the way, we didn't have time to get too much into this class, but then it will also record the change in the indexes as well, right? Because you don't want to, uh, every time you come back from a crash, you don't want to uh, repopulate or recreate the entire expensive index either, right? But we don't have time to get into too much detail. That's physical logging. Logical logging, I mean, very straightforward. It's just the uh, specific query, right? And then you, when you come back, you're just going to re-execute this query. And with this physiological logging, it's very similar to physical logging, just instead of just to record the specific offset of this tuple, right? It's just going to record a slot of this tuple or identifier of this tuple, right? Tell the system that, hey, I modified a tuple, right? With this ID something something, and before and after value, right? When the database come, come back, it has the freedom to insert this tuple back into this uh, page at a location that it seems most optimized, right? Again, just a little bit uh, modification or tweak of the, uh, of the uh, physical logging. Right? But at a high level, it's pretty similar. All right, and then uh, in practice, most database systems would actually just use the third type of physiological logging. All right, cool. So I think we probably don't have time to get to the uh, checkpoint today. We'll just, uh, just directly roll that content uh, into the net class, right? So yeah, next, uh, but I want to get to the conclusion yet, if I conclude here, right? So uh, essentially, right, so in most database system, we will just uh, favor the uh, right head logging, by right? favor the uh, runtime comparing to the uh, recovery time, because we assume that recovery or crash would really be uh, rare in practice. And then we'll, uh, I mean, before the checkpoint, we didn't really have uh, time to talk about, so we'll roll over that to our next class. And then uh, on the recovery time, right, what we need to do with those log records is that essentially we'll use the uh, undo records from those, uh, log, from those log files to restore the uh, changes of the uncommitted transactions. And then we are going to use the redo records uh, from, this log, log, uh, from this log file to uh, reapply all the changes from the committed transactions, right? So essentially after that, we are going to restore the database system back into a correct state, okay? So next class, we're just going to talk about checkpoint protocols, and then we're going to talk about recovery procedure. Talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. For a mic check, bust it, the fuse all set, then grab a 40. To put him the yoga, snap his neck, St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips, cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double.